Math 13, 14, Tyler Junior College, section 3.1, quadratic functions. Application, trajectory. Now, you may or may not know the following fact, but if you take an object, any object, and fling it through the air, if there are no external forces acting upon it, such as wind, hitting a building, or throwing into a tree, no external forces except gravity. Now that object, as it flies through the air, will follow a parabolic path. That's not just speculation, that's proven in terms of physics and mathematics and calculus. So anytime something flies through the air, a golf ball, a football, uh, a soccer ball, and other things that aren't balls, like an arrow, or uh, if you just grab a, I don't know, if you just grab a stick and fling it through the air, it will follow a parabolic path. Next time you get a drink from a water fountain, the kind that shoots up, not the kind that dispenses into a bottle. Look at the water, parabola. So because things that fly through the air follow a parabolic trajectory, there should be an equation that defines the path it follows, and there does exist such a function or equation. Uh, coming up with the equation involves a little bit more than we can do in this class. It involves trigonometry. Actually, that's all it involves is trigonometry, and may, maybe a little bit of vector math. But let's say that we already have the function that defines the path of an object. For example, a punted football has a trajectory along the graph of f of x equals negative 0.01x squared plus 1.18x plus 2, where x equals the horizontal distance traveled in feet, and f of x equals the elevation of the football after traveling x feet. In other words, somebody punted a football. They probably dropped it and kicked it. I, I, I can tell you how I know it's not on a tee. And when I say football, by the way, I mean American football, not what Americans call soccer. But I can tell you that this, this football was drop kicked, not just kicked from a tee. And I'll tell you how I know that in a minute. Think. How do I know that it was drop kicked and not kicked off the tee? Because I know what the y-intercept is of this function. Do you know the y-intercept of this function? Do you know what you get when you substitute zero? Gone, gone, f of zero equals two. Because when I drop the football, it hasn't traveled horizontally any, it stands to reason that we can represent the punter being at the y-axis. And since the x-intercept is a 2, the y-intercept is a 2, that means that when the ball began its path, it was 2 feet off the ground. So it wasn't on the ground being punted, it was drop kicked. All right, so what are we going to answer? Three things. Find the maximum height, when does it occur? A defensive player is 6 feet from the punter. How far must he reach to block the punt? And if the ball isn't blocked, how far will it travel? Before we find these things, let's get a visual of exactly what we're looking for. The maximum height is clearly going to be at the vertex. So if we can locate the vertex, we can answer two questions. The highest height, the maximum height obtained, and how far it traveled horizontally once it reached that height. For the defensive player problem, we have to think a little bit more. But it's saying there's a defensive player six feet from the punter. And the question is, how far must he reach to block the punt, assuming he reaches vertically? That's equivalent to asking how far in the air is the ball after it's traveled six feet horizontally. That's easy, just stick six into the function. As far as if the ball isn't blocked, how far will it travel before it hits the ground? The answer to that is however far this is. But if we know the coordinates of this point, the x-coordinate will tell me how far it is, and that's an x-intercept. Kind of surprised I didn't ask you how far off the ground was the ball when it was punted, but we've already discussed that the answer is 2. So, we've got three things to do. Locate and interpret the vertex. Evaluate the function at 6 to see how far off the ground the ball was at that point. And then locate the x-intercepts. Well, there appears to be one, but we'll get two, and you'll see why in a moment. And that'll tell us how far the ball traveled. All right, so let's do the first part. Let's find the vertex. Well, that's just a formula. 
x equals negative b over 2a. b in this problem is 1.18, so negative of 1.18. The a is negative 0.01, so 2 times negative 0.01. And if you'll just allow me to, I'll just work this out real quick in my head. Or I'll do it verbally. The negatives cancel. This gives me 0.02. If I move this decimal, it's going to be 59. Should be exactly 59 feet. But that doesn't answer the whole question. That answers when it occurs. That tells me that after the ball is traveling 59 feet, it has reached the apex of its trajectory. But how high is that apex? Well, that's the y coordinate. Y equals f of 59. Okay, this is just calculator work. Put the 59 here, put the 59 here. Mash buttons on a calculator. I've already got the problem worked out, so I'll spare you the trouble. It's about, it's not about, it's exactly 36.81. Again, saving a little bit of time in the video by saying if you substitute 59 into the function, it will come out 36.81 feet. So the answer to the question, the maximum height is 36.81 feet, and it occurs at x equals 59 feet. So it's traveled 59 feet when it reaches the high point. Now if you're thinking, oh, now how far it traveled, double that. Well, no, because it didn't start on the ground over here. If I double the 59, it would tell me how far I traveled when it's two more feet off the ground before it hits the ground. So I'm going to guess that the distance it traveled is a little bit more than 118 feet, which is double 59. All right, part B, a defensive player is six feet from the punter. So there's a guy standing here, six feet away. That's a picture of a stick man. I know it doesn't look like it. How high is the ball there? Well, how high is the Y coordinate? when the x-coordinate is 6. So all we have to do is substitute 6 into the function. And again, I've already got it worked out, or rather it's already worked out in the book I'm using for reference. And it's 8.72. That means if I'm standing 6 feet away from the puncher when he kicks the ball, the ball is going to clear my head at 8.72 feet. Now, can I block that? I can't, probably. Maybe if my legs were not as sore as they are, but I think a tall football player with a big arm span and strong legs to jump high could possibly block that. But if the ball isn't blocked, how far will it travel before it hits the ground? Well, that's asking what is this x-intercept? So we have to find the x-intercept. And to find the x-intercept, we have to put the function equal to zero and solve it. So here comes the quadratic formula. We have to solve the function equal to zero. There's a technique I would normally recommend. In fact, I'm going to. Why? Because if you're watching this video, I want you to learn things that make math easier, not harder. If I were solving this, I would not get out the quadratic formula yet for two reasons. Number one, the negative in front, which I know how to fix. And number two, all the decimals. I can fix both of those things by multiplying by the right thing. Multiplying by a negative will fix the negative in front, but the trick for moving a decimal is to multiply by 10. Every time you multiply by 10, the decimal moves one more place to the left. I want to move these two places to the left, so I would have to multiply by 10 and then 10 again. Well, 10 times 10 is 100. So I'm going to multiply this entire equation times negative 100, which will change the signs and move every decimal two places to the right. Change the sign, move the decimal two places, it leaves me just an x squared. Change the sign, move the decimal two places, 118x. Change the sign, move the decimal two places, gives me 200. Now the numbers are larger, but at least I don't have to drag around a bunch of decimals. I'm tempted to try to factor this, but let's go ahead and get out the quadratic formula because I don't think it will factor x equals negative b, so 118, plus or minus the square root of, we'll come back to that in a second, 2 times a. If you do enough quadratic formulas, you start realizing that you can set up the discriminant, the part under the square root above it, and then write its answer under the square root. 
For example, here I would set up negative 118 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 200. Well, that may be kind of hard for you to see. But I just set up the part that's normally under the square root. I just set it up over the square root. Then I'm going to work it out in a calculator. 118 squared. Oh, this is a junk calculator. Give me a good calculator. Where's all my good calculators? Where's my scientific calculators? Uh, I must have taken them out of the room. One second, I'll just grab a calculator on this computer. All right, so negative 118 squared, and let's, let's face it, I don't have to make it negative because I'm squaring it, minus four times one is four times negative 200. All right, oh, that's not right because it's not negative two million anything. How did that happen? B squared, 118 squared, I'm not sure what happened here. Let me try this again. 118 squared. It's going to end up being plus 800. 14,724. 14,724. And if I square root that, now if you're wondering why aren't you trying to simplify it or anything, from well, first off, the square root of that is probably ugly. The square root of that is 121 point a bunch of decimals. So why would I want to actually get a decimal here instead of trying to simplify the square root? Because I'm trying to answer a real world, a real world problem. Don't ever answer a, a real world problem like how far did the football travel with something like 18 plus or minus the square root of 14,724 all over 2. I mean, that may be correct, but that's completely useless because it doesn't really answer my question well. Whenever you're measuring something, you should always come up with a decimal, or at least a fraction, but never leave it as a square root. So 18 plus or minus the square root of 14,724. Let's take it to two decimal places, or one decimal place, 121.3. So I have to do the plus and the minus, but I don't. I don't have to bother with the minus. Why not? If I subtracted here, 118 minus 121.3 is negative. Cut it in half and it's still negative. This number's not. In fact, the minus version of the answer would give us the other x-intercept if this parabola kept going to the left. So really all I have to worry about here is the plus. Now you can't always just say, don't do the minus when it's an application. In this application, the minus gives an answer that doesn't make sense. In some applications, they both might make sense. Or in some applications, the minus answer might make sense, but the plus answer might not. If we divide that by 2, we get about, well, the answer to this is 119.65. So as I predicted earlier, it was a little bit more than 118 because it traveled 59 feet to the vertex, another 59 feet until it was the same distance off the ground, and it looks like about a foot and a half further. So as you can tell, application problems, the hardest part is getting them set up. Once you get it set up and know what it is to do, then it's just, it's just a math problem. I got a couple more applications I want to show you. Uh, the next one's a little bit easier to, uh, to get started.